This morning, if you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, I'm going to get there in just a minute, but we're continuing, and, and we shall, uh, Lord willing, finish next time, looking at uh, godly dads, godly fathers, godly men like Joseph. We start on Father's Day last week. We're, we're continuing now this week, and we're looking at the elements that God has pointed out are, are those life-changing choices that Joseph made, and, and I'm going to pull all that together, but before I do, I want to explain something that uh, I've really been thinking about this week as I prepared this and, and prayed over it. Um, this summer, we took our children as uh, part of their uh, reward for doing well in school. We took them to this little uh, amusement park in Missouri. It's, I don't know, some green phone or something like that, uh, Missouri, and it's called the Silver Dollar City Place, and uh, some of you have probably heard of that. And it's enough to wear you out to go there. Uh, just the driving through Branson is bad enough, but uh, wearing out there. But I was in one of the back shacks. You know, they, they have all these little country things, and it was the Apple one, if you know where it is. It's by the, the water plunge place. I mean, that's about the most out-of-the-way place you can be in the park. And, and I expected. I was leaning over the taffy jar, uh, getting one for Joseph. And I was, had my hand in there. And, you know, when you're at Branson, you're all wet and you you know, and everything. You expect to see no one. And just as I got my hand in the jar, someone said, Hi, Pastor. <laughs> I looked up and I thought, of all places, I mean, this is in the back corner. I was in the back room, uh, you know, and I thought, who is here? And there's this sweet couple. I haven't seen them for a couple months. They hadn't been to church for a couple months. And I took my hand out of the taffy jar and started talking to them. And I said, how are you? And to make a long story short, it was really sweet. They said, well, we're not too well. They said, we really love the church, but we can't go there anymore. And I said, how come? And they said, because we stayed for two months, and we found out we're not good enough to be at that church. Everybody there is perfect. They said, did you know, we're struggling. They said, we have trouble with our kids. We've been married before, both of us, one of them more than once. And they said, every time we came on Sunday, everybody, everything was perfect in their lives. They said, every week we'd come like this, and we'd wait, and we'd look and say, will someone please say they're having a problem? Because we are. And I thought, well, I wish they, they're at Branson this morning, but I'll say it for them. Did you know life is hard, and we have problems, and we struggle, and, and raising children is the hardest thing I've ever seen? And this message on, on how to be a godly father is, is incredibly hard? Did you know that? The only thing is, we know that, but we ought to say it once in a while. We ought to say it to some of these new people and say, did you know, even though you come to our fellowship groups and to our uh, different times here at the church, and even though we're smiling, it's just the Lord. It's not us. We can't do it on our own. And I thought that was so sweet in the apple shack in the taffy jar to meet a couple that said, we're not perfect. Well, I told them, I, I said, well, I can't speak for everybody else in church, but I'll just tell, me, tell you about me. When I got all done, they said, well, we're not sure we want to go to that church now, you know. Uh, uh, you're not perfect enough for us, but, uh, but uh, I will say this, that it is hard. And you'll see from Joseph's life, and what I like about Joseph is that we're looking at, he was a great dad, but we don't know anything else about him except his parenting. Did you ever realize that? Why is it that God, the only thing great about Joseph is he raised seven children, and one of them was the son of God. And that's all we know. We don't know anything else about him. Just what he did with his family. And that's what God thought was important. Well, one of the biggest struggles in life for men is being a dad, if you are one. And what I started thinking about this week is, how do you qualify to be a dad? I mean, there's no courses. You don't have to get a license. It just happens. And all of a sudden, you're presented. And I remember at Los Angeles Hospital, when I was presented at Verdugo Hills Hospital, uh, they just handed me Johnny. They said, here you go. I said, oh, thanks. You know, you know and you're afraid you're going to break them and drop them and you don't know what to do and and every time you change the diaper, you think they're dying and, and everything else. It's very challenging. And I thought, I didn't go to school for this. I mean, I went, I went for many years of graduate school and postgraduate school, but no one taught me about this. It's hard, very hard. But you know, God likes to use unqualified people. Uh, you have to qualify to get on teams and sports, and you have to qualify to get jobs, and you have to qualify to get scholarships, and you have to qualify to, to get loans, and you have to qualify to get credit cards. But God says, you know what? I take the unqualified. And what's wonderful about that is then all the focus is on the Lord that he does it. It's not on the instrument. I was reading this week about a great uh, violinist that 
had a Strata various, one of those $100,000 violins, and announced that he was going to play it and packed the concert hall with all the classical people that love all that stuff. And, and the place was just teeming. And he came out with this violin, and he played the most impressive piece. And then he took the violin and dropped it, and everyone just gasped. And then he jumped up and down on it and just smashed it. Well, the place was falling apart, and he left. And the stage manager came out and said, just want to calm your hearts, folks. That was not the expensive violin. That was just the cheap $20 one. And he came out and then played the same piece a second time on the beautiful, magnificent, very famous violin. You know what his point was? His point was, it's not, by the way, it sounded the same. His point was, it doesn't matter if you have the most qualified instrument or the most unqualified instrument, the, the result is in the master's touch to the instrument. And that's what I think about parenting here. I think about, and I, I still can't forget that sweet couple that said, we're not perfect. That's who God wants to use, the people that know they're not perfect. And the quality of what they do in their life is not them. It's the master's touch through them. And that's what we're going to see in Joseph's life. An unqualified man who joined a lot of other unqualified people because God uses doubting and sometimes disobedient dads named Abraham to be the father of his faithful. I mean, Abraham had ten tests and he failed five of them. He didn't make it. Uh, he, he picked the wrong woman in Egypt. He, he took Hagar and, and he lied about his wife and then he lied about her again. And then he was impatient. And then, I mean, he's just right down the line. He's just kind of normal. But God used him. And then his grandson Jacob was a cheat and a liar, yet... God named his people Israel after Jacob, Israel. And Moses was a murderer and he dragged his feet in disobedience and yet he led and taught God's people and he knew God like no one else knew him face to face. He was followed by Joshua who was fooled by the Gibeonites and, and, and made a pact that caused the generations of problems to Israel and yet unqualified and failing though he was, God used him mightily. And Gideon had trouble trusting God. He had to have all these tests and fleeces. And yet God used him mightily. And then I think of David. David was a ladies' man and a poor father. But God said, he's a man after my own heart. Unqualified yet qualified by God. And all this to say that he is not the person that God uses. It's the Lord. And we're all unqualified. And we all are unable to do what needs to be done. And so the key is a willing and responsive heart that lets God do it through us. And so that's what God's looking for. And there's no end to what will happen when we let God use us. Great thing. Let me show you where we've been. Number one, we learned last week that godly dads like Joseph are full of compassion. And the verse I gave you, and if you, didn't, if you weren't here, Matthew 1.19, this is what it says. And Joseph, her husband, this is Joseph and Mary before they're married. Joseph was a just man. He didn't want to make Mary a public example, so he put her away secretly. He was compassionate. He demonstrated love to his family. And, and I showed you in Matthew 2 the same concept. In Matthew 2.13, when things got dangerous, Joseph was a leader in caring and showing compassion. He protected his family. He made decisions about their future, and he took care of them. Now, I don't know if that was natural to him or not, but I do know it was a right response to God's direction in his life. And, and a godly dad will be one who is full of compassion. You say, where do you get that? Well, the Scripture says that the wisdom is from above, is full of compassion. It's pure and peaceable and gentle. And maybe you weren't made that way. Maybe, Dad, you were born tough. You know, where you showed no affection. Where your dad was tough. And maybe you have trouble showing affection. Well, it, it's not you. It's the affection and the compassion that can come from Christ. And I guess that's the key to all this. The person that influenced me most in my parenting never had any physical children. The Lord Jesus Christ. And yet he encouraged me in his compassion for children. He encouraged me in his patience. The Lord Jesus Christ is our example. Maybe your dad wasn't a good example. Maybe he was a perfect example. But Jesus Christ is the ultimate example. And what I see in Joseph is he's reflecting the character of Christ because he was full of compassion and he demonstrated love. The second thing we saw is, and, and uh, this is again in Matthew, we saw that godly dads like Joseph listened to God. And remember the angel came and spoke to Joseph and told him what to do. And what did he do? He obeyed right away. He did just what the angel said, even though it was hard. And the third thing we learned last time is that godly dads like Joseph stay in touch with God. And I showed you in Matthew 2, 13 through 19, that the angel keeps coming and telling him what to do. And he kept doing it. 
godly dads just, they don't just get in touch with God once. They realize so much that they need God's power and they need His, His direction that they can't make without Him that they just stay in tune with Him all the time. And godly dads like Joseph are constantly staying in touch with God. It's significant that the man that the Bible says walked with God. Remember Enoch walked with God? Do you remember that from Genesis 5? Do you know when he started walking with God? After the birth of his children. After his children were born. I don't know if he walked with God before that. Maybe he didn't think he needed to. But you know, when you get those variables, children are such variables. They're just little self-directed missiles and you just don't know what they're doing. You just have to pray and wait and and and. And I've spent more time, uh, this confession day, I spend more time praying for my children than I do for the missionaries. I mean, the missionaries are doing all right out there. Just need a little prayer. My children need a lot of prayer. And sometimes it's children that bring us into this dependence. And that's what happened with Enoch. And that's what happened with Joseph. Godly dads like Joseph stay in touch with God. And then in verse 19, we saw fourthly that godly dads like Joseph work hard to provide for their families. But now, this morning, and I told you Luke 2, and this is where I want to really dig down and and spend some time, uh, and we're going to conclude in a real practical way. But look at Luke 2 and verse 41. Because godly dads, like Joseph, lead their families in worship. They lead their families in worship. His parents, it says in 241 of Luke, went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. Now, Nazareth is up on a ridge. It's, it's up in Galilee. In fact, it's up right on the edge of, of, uh, of nowhere. And, and it's not a good place to live if you were a good Jerusalem Jew because they were bumpkins out there. But, but it says in Luke 2.41 that, that in spite of that social pressure, in spite of the, the distance, in spite of the cost, his parents used to go to Jerusalem every year. Every year. And you know what? Joseph went. And Joseph probably led the, the parade. He probably took the donkey so that all the children could be riding. I can just see them, you know, having all seven of those kids on that donkey, and Joseph and Mary walking down and going to Jerusalem with their little lamb that they're going to sacrifice at Passover that they had picked out. And I'm sure that Joseph spent time with his children explaining to them about the lamb. And it must have been a significant thing when he went off and bought this. And you know the story. You have to bring the lamb into the house and make the kids kind of really love that lamb. And then you identify with the lamb, and then you kill the lamb. It's a real moving thing. It's very graphic. It must have been amazing to have the lamb of God living in your house, Jesus, and be talking about the picture of him. And I'm sure Joseph even sensed that too. But Joseph led his family in worship, and he took his family down, and it was a long walk. But Joseph was a worshiper, and he took them to the feast, and he was a leader in godliness. If you want to put your finger here, look at Proverbs 22. Because remember, Joseph didn't have the New Testament. We're looking at at a, a person in the New Testament that's prior to all the revelation being written down. And so he was reflecting back on the Old Testament. And in Proverbs 22 and verse 28, it's interesting... What I see that, that Joseph was doing is he was following this, this great um, exhortation from the Scriptures. It says in Proverbs 22, 28, Do not move the ancient boundary which your fathers have set. You say, that. what does that mean to us? Well, remember, Joshua came down and conquered the Promised Land, and then there were the tribal allotments, and they put all the tribes you know, from all the way down through the Promised Land on both sides of the Jordan, all the way down toward the Negev, and they all had their places. So there was a tribal allotment. And then each family got to carve up within their tribal allotment their land. And the original uh, uh, occupants of Canaan, they marked out their land, and their, this clan had this portion. And what they do is they put rocks at the corners of the field. And they'd, they'd have a rock here, and a rock here, and a rock here. And they'd say, this is uh, the Smith family, uh, 200 acres. And, and so for generations, the Smith family lived here. But, you know, when you're out plowing your field, if you're the Jones family, you'd say, boy, you know, that's really fertile soil. You know, all you'd have to do is just pick up the rock and move it over here a little ways on both corners, you know. And then your family would get that. And what he's saying here is, don't move the old boundary stones your fathers have set. Maintain them. Keep them where they are. Don't try and enlarge your fields bigger than they are. And don't steal someone else's and don't let them come in on you. 
And we say, what is that? We don't have fields nowadays. Well, look back at Luke 2.41. That's a boundary stone. Luke 2.41. Did you know Joseph could have plowed some new ground? He could have said, you know, I don't want to go down to Jerusalem. It's too expensive. I don't want to get up that early. I remember when I used to go to Sunday school as a little boy, I went with my parents, but all my neighborhood kids didn't. Their parents slept in on Sunday. And they would ride with us because their parents were too tired to take them to church. Now, they were very religious, these parents, supposedly, but they couldn't go to church. And did you know that the children I grew up with whose parents didn't go to church, so few of them now have any concept of God? Because their God was just something that was convenient, inconvenient for their parents, but convenient to send them off to, and they never experienced him. Their parents didn't keep the, the old boundary stone. They didn't do what Acts, or Luke 2.41 says, that his parents went. His parents went every year at the Feast of Passover. And if they went to Passover, I'm sure that they did everything in between. And, and I, I don't want to go into all the Jewish uh, uh, customs and all the Jewish feasts and everything, but basically, Joseph led his family in worship. He was a leader in godliness. He taught them what they needed to know. He, he didn't tell them to do it. He did it, and they followed him. And that's the mark of someone that God can use, someone who's a leader in godliness, someone who leads their family in worship. And, and you say, but what if I'm not very good at it? Well, what does it mean to be good at it? Uh, the, the power is in God. I mean, uh, regularly people ask us, what do you do? Uh, we do everything that's possible to be done. I mean, we read the Bible. We tell Bible stories. We act the Bible stories out. We sing songs. We, we do verses. We have question and answer time. Uh, I told you last week, we even have devotional times at the QT. We look at people and talk about them and say, this is how they fit in the scriptures. Leading your family in worship is not getting a, one of those great big family Bibles and carrying it around. Leading your family in worship is just bringing God into every part of life. Praying. Praying before you go places. Praying when events happen. Letting your children see you doing ministry. Letting your children see you learning from the Word of God and explaining the Bible to them. Encouraging them to read it. Asking them if they are. Helping them to learn their verses. Not saying, go learn your verses, but learn them with them. Joseph led his family in worship. Well, I want to hasten on because the most important thing is uh, in verse 27 of uh, chapter 2. But let me just read this to you because this is, this is uh, difficult. Godly dads, like Joseph, in 2.27, follow God's word for raising their kids. And this is the last point, and it's the hardest one. Because it's easy to raise our children the way culture's raising them. It's easy to raise our children the way maybe our parents raised us. It's easy to raise our children the way that the latest book says. But it says in Luke 2.27 that godly dads like Joseph follow God's word for raising their kids. Did you know you won't fail to please God if you follow the Word? Now, you might please everyone else but God if you don't follow His Word. And maybe if you follow God's Word, people will be unhappy. But the most important thing I see in life is, Acts 2.27, having a dad that is in the power of the Spirit obeying the Word of God in the way he raises his children. Now, what do I mean by that? And I want to explain to you a little bit. Because you see, it's very hard to, to raise children. Joseph had six children plus Jesus. He was a carpenter. And Joseph poured his life into them because I believe he believed the Scriptures. He believed that children were an eternal blessing. Now, if you see children as anything less than an eternal blessing, you won't enjoy it. If you don't think children are gifts from the Lord, as the Bible says, you won't enjoy parenting them according to the Word of God. If you don't believe that children are a reward... Uh, we were just up at Hillcrest when we had little Elisha. And I'll tell you what, Hillcrest is an interesting place to have your children. Uh, you, you really get a lesson in culture up there. I mean, the people around us, most of the people that had their children on the same area we did, I don't think they thought they were a reward. I mean, there were actually arguments in the hall uh, in, in Hillcrest over these children. They, they were not excited about them being here. And you could just see the way they pushed them out in the wheelchair when they left with those kids. You know, like, what am I going to do with this thing? 
And, and the Bible says, no, no. Psalm 127, sons are a heritage from the Lord. Children are a reward, verse 3 says, from him. Verse 4, they are like arrows in the hands of a warrior. How would you like to be a warrior without arrows? God says you're incomplete in life if you choose to not have children. You say, wait a minute, we can't have children, or I'm single, or I'm never married. Well, that God has a plan for that too. God says the children of those that have no children are more than those that have physical children. You can have spiritual children. But in our world, there aren't a lot of Josephs nowadays that think children are a reward. The Bible says, Blessed is the one who has children. They will not be put to shame when they are with their enemies in the gate. But having children limits things. It limits our toys. You know, if you have children, you might not be able to have this fancy of a boat or as many off-road vehicles. You might not be able to have a fancy car because they might mess it up. If you have children, you maybe can't have those exotic vacations or excessive amount of time for sports. You won't have as much discretionary spending. Having children limits your time. It limits your flexibility. It limits your mobility. It diminishes your financial savings. It takes a great deal of emotional and spiritual energy to have children, but it's one of the only investments that you can enjoy both here on earth and in heaven. You know, you can invest in heaven, and you can invest on earth, but children are one of the investments that you can totally enjoy in both places. It provides one of the only investments that will honor you both here and in heaven. Children are a direct, physical, visible, tangible blessing from the Lord. Children are unique because they're your very own, plus they can become your brothers and sisters in Christ, plus they can become your best friends for life. Nothing is more precious as the years pass than to see your children following Christ. Nothing is more heart-wrenching than to see them not follow Christ. In, a world today, in the world today, there's a myth that children are expensive. The truth is that they are rich and precious treasures that people that have them not are impoverished. I remember a group of us that went through school together. I went to Michigan State University for a while. I remember some of the fellows I went through school with made a choice. And one in particular, I'll never forget him, Walt. He says, you know what? He said, I want to have white carpet in my house. And he says, and I want to have a beautiful house. And he says, and I want to have... He says, I, I don't like children. And I've kept in touch with Walt. And they chose to not have children. Walt's older than I am now. Last time I talked to him, he and his wife were weeping. He said, we are so lonely. He says, we have a $600,000 condominium. He says, we have a place on the water. He says, we've been all over the world. He says, we have the, the nicest he does, nicest sports car you've ever seen. And he says, and we still have our pure white furniture and carpet. And he says, we're absolutely lonesome. He said, we're looking into adoption. You know what? I think our world has this myth that they don't like to listen to God and they want to do it their own way. And they don't realize that though children appear to be expensive, they're precious treasures sent from God. And happy is anyone who has them. And in an age characterized by 2 Timothy 3, where people love themselves and love their money and are boastful and proud and abusive and and ungrateful and unholy, God says, I'll give you something that will make you totally helpless and dependent on me. I'll put you in a position where you have to trust me because godly parents and godly dads like Joseph have to trust and follow God's word to raise their children. Let me show you how. Look at Luke 2.27, and I want to just wind down here. We're going to look at one other passage before we go. If, if you want to be full of compassion, if you want to listen to God, if you want to stay in touch with God and be sensitive and work hard to provide for your family, then this is the key. You have to follow God's word for raising children. And it says, so he came, this is Zacharias, by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents, this is Joseph and Mary now enter, they brought the child Jesus. Now listen to verse 27. To do for him according to the custom of the law. Did you catch that? Joseph and Mary raised Jesus according to the Word of God. Now, did Jesus need to have all this stuff done? I mean, did he have to be brought to the temple? Did he have to be circumcised? Did he have to have the offering? After 40 days, did Mary have to purify herself? I mean, he was perfect. Why did they do it? Because godly dads like Joseph follow God's Word for raising children. And it doesn't matter if the Lord chooses in his sovereignty for, for you to have one or many or none, or maybe you're, as the Bible calls it, without children, you have spiritual children. But whatever in, 
uh, touch you have with children in this world, whether it's physical children that you bear, whether it's your family's uh, children, nieces and nephews that you raise, or, or your uh, adopted children, or you have none and you have children that are spiritual that you lead to Christ. The only way that you can please God and I can please God is, listen, to follow God's word for raising them. Now, what does God's word say about it? Now, this is where we're going to close. One last verse. Ephesians 6, 4. Best verse for dads on parenting. Four parts to it I want to show you this morning. This is God's word on how to raise children, and I love it. It says in verse 4 that fathers, and that's who we're talking about, don't provoke their children. They bring them up, they discipline them, and they train them in the Lord. Four things. I want to show them to you real quickly. Four things that godly dads who are going to raise their kids according to the word are going to do. Number one, they're going to heed God's warning. Ephesians 6, 4 says, fathers, don't exasperate your children. Ephesians 6, 4, fathers. You want to be godly? You want to raise them according to the word? Don't exasperate them. Now, that's what the person at the apple shack was talking about, I think. Because when they said that we're so perfect, did you know that, that if we appear to be perfect, that it exasperates people because they can't see how, how it works? Did you know sometimes it's that way for children? If it appears they never do anything right. Here, here's one. Beware of overprotecting them. That exasperates them. If you overprotect them, if a boy can't be a boy, if he can't run, if he can't climb, if he can't get scraped and explore, they'll never develop into the leader and protector they have to become. I mean, you can't overprotect them. I mean, some people are overprotect their children. That's exasperating to them. Secondly, some, some children are not only overprotected, but they're favored. Uh, it says here, don't exasperate them. Do you remember two classic ch- children that got exasperated? Jacob and Esau? I mean, here is Mama had her apron around Jacob. I mean, he was taking cooking 101. I mean, he was really something. And here's this big, tough, suntanned, muscle-bound Esau who couldn't do anything right for mom. But dad, he was the favored son. And what I see there is the, the danger of favoring one of them. Esau and Jacob's mom, Rebecca, and then Jacob doting over his son Joseph, the next generation, embittered everyone around him. That's okay to love your children, but you know what? All my children think they're the favorite, and they are. They're all favorite. You should love them all uniquely and most. And I love each of them the most because there's only one of them, but you don't favor them. And it exasperates them when you overprotect them. It exasperates them when you favor one over the other. It exasperates them when you discourage them. If you always tell them they'll never amount to anything, they might start believing you. If you say, you're a pain, they might start feeling it. And when you raise them according to the Word of God, you don't exasperate them. You don't discourage them. You don't destroy their individuality. God made them gifted in a unique way as spiritual snowflakes. Don't try and clone yourself in them. Let God make them into the way He planned. That's what the Bible says. Train up a child in the way he should go. It's not your way. It's the way of God, the way He made them. And you don't make flute players into football players. And you don't you don't try and conform them into what you always want to be. Don't destroy their individuality. And don't put them off. Do you ever think about that? We're always putting them to bed early so we can do something. Put, put your work to bed early. Put the TV to bed early. And spend special long times with those fast-passing childhood days. You know, it's terrible that children always have to live on scraps of our time. We give the lion's share to our work. We give the lion's share to our goals. We give the scraps back to the children. Finally, another exasperating thing that fathers need to be aware of is bitter words and outright cruelty. Don't abuse children verbally or physically. That means do not correct them in anger. James 1.20 says, The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. It's an amazing thing how, how one of the prime emotions that, that we have as men is, is anger. It's, it's kind of a protective thing. It's kind of a, something so that we don't stop, we keep going. But when that prime emotion of anger is directed toward that little tiny life, it's so destructive. And I tell you, one of the turning points in your parenting will be when you get to the place where you say to that little life, 
I was angry and that was wrong. Now, you disobeyed and the correction was right, but the way I administered it was wrong. And those are the turning points. And I can remember with my own children and, and how many times I've come to them and I've said, you were wrong, but Dad was wrong. And before we talk about you being wrong, we'll settle that Dad was wrong. doesn't stop the discipline. doesn't stop the correction. doesn't stop the instruction. But it does bring a, a little touch of reality down that Mom and Dad are not perfect. And Dad will admit to you when he's wrong. And, and maybe even have an even greater platform of instruction. But number one, godly dads don't exasperate their children. Look at Ephesians 6, 4. Here's the second one. It says, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Listen, but bring them up. Now, that's one word. Bring them up is one word. Listen to what the word is. Literally, nourish and provide with tender care. You know what the second thing dads do? Number one, they don't exasperate. Number two, they tenderly nourish their children. You know, a godly father will tenderly nourish his children. He'll always take time to listen to them before he disciplines them so that they know that you care about them. He'll always apologize when his response has been wrong or harsh or angry or negligent. He'll always accept concerns and, and criticism and ideas from his wife and put them in practice. That's what a, a tenderly nourishing dad. He'll be a hugger. He'll be a holder. He'll be an encourager. He'll be a friend. And he doesn't just put it on the children. He'll spread it out onto mom, too. He tenderly nourishes them. He brings them up with tender provision. You can't be harsh with tender little plants. You can't be harsh with weak, little, frail, delicate objects. You have to tenderly care for them. We know that in our own bodies, the, the weaknesses we have, we protect them. In our children, a godly father will never neglect the tender nourishing that children need. Thirdly, look at verse 4. There's another one. You don't provoke them. You're nourishing them tenderly. But look what it says in verse 4. In the training. That's neat too. Training by means of rules and regulations and rewards and when necessary punishment is what this literally means. It's, it's a term about keeping them in lines according to the grid, according to, to the specs, if you're an engineer. You keep them according to specs. And, and you do the training. Let me read to you what was in the paper recently when some of those amazing British royalty came here. They were interviewed after their tour, and, and the CNN came up, and they said, could you tell us what's the most amazing thing you observe in America? They stuck the microphone up. I wrote this down because it was so fascinating. Without a moment's hesitation, the reporter was told by the royal family member, the most amazing thing about America is the way... Parents obey their children. You know, who's training who nowadays? God says, you bring up your children in the training that you regulate, you reward, and when necessary, you punish them. Ken Taylor, who wrote the Living Bible for his children, wrote this on this very text. A father's task is so many-sided, but the most important part of his work is to fit himself and his family into God's plan of family authority. Children are to be encouraged by dads, patting them on the back, helping them to better things when necessary, but also by the application of a hand or stick to the seat of learning. Of course, there are many methods of discipline, Ken Taylor said, besides spanking, but whatever is called for must be used, and to refuse to discipline a child is to refuse the clear command of God. A child who does not learn to obey both of his parents will find it nearly impossible to obey God. Well, last thing. I said to be practical. Ephesians 6, 4, number one says that we are to be not discouraging them. Secondly, we're to be tenderly nourishing them. Thirdly, we're supposed to be training them. But look at verse 4, the last three words. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. You know what the bottom line of godly parenting and fatherhood is? We, dads, must be Christ-like. We must, above all else, be concerned that our relationship with Him is a good reflection of Christ to them. And, and you cannot exasperate them, and you can tenderly nourish them, and you can discipline them, but if you don't do it in a Christ-like way, they get the wrong message. 
I started out and I want to conclude with the same point. You don't have to be qualified to be a father. You don't have to have great training to be a father. You just have to be willing to say, apart from you, I can do nothing. God wants to use the weak. God wants to use those who have no strength. He wants to use those who have failed. But he wants them to say that I'm going to obey your word. And I'm going to be a godly father like Joseph. And I'm going to be a godly father that raises my children according to your word. And I'm going to be a godly father like Joseph who is sensitive to you and stays in touch with you. And I'm going to be a godly father that leads my family in worship. And I'm going to be one who is utterly dependent upon God's power to do the most impossible thing I could do in this life. It's easier to run a company. It's easier to run a country than it is to raise a family. God's way. And so God takes a bunch of unqualified people, men, and calls them to do the impossible in his strength. Let's bow before the God of the impossible and let him encourage our hearts that we're not perfect, but he certainly is. And Lord, even this morning, I think of... uh, that sweet couple that so struggled with their imperfections. And I pray that they would realize that they're surrounded by imperfect people. We all are painfully aware of our frailties and weaknesses. And we all need you. Oh, we need you. Every hour, we need you. And as fathers, specifically our focus this morning, we want to, like Joseph, respond to you and be sensitive and listen and stay in touch and then be directed by your word and specifically some really practical ways that you would help us to be godly dads for your glory. And I pray that as we go through life and as we struggle, that we would share our struggles, that those around us would be encouraged as they see that we are fellow strugglers following the same Lord, partaking the same grace, and living to the same example of you, Lord Jesus. And this morning, if there's anyone here who perhaps it's not parenting that's on their heart, maybe it's just the Christian life, and they think that it's too hard, it's impossible, may they realize it is. But may they realize that you, Lord Jesus Christ, came to take those who are hopeless and helpless and to give them the power to be the children of God. Help us this morning to trust you, to rest, and to realize that you want to work through us as dads, as moms, as children, as men and women, for your glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.